it's fun to be able to talk about uh, things where there's a political advantage for Democrats and a massive public policy advantage for all of us, um, you know, and in, in moving from the vaccine mandate to, you know, what's winding through Congress as we speak. There are five committees that are, uh, you know, uh, looking at different aspects of the three point five trillion dollar budget uh, bill, uh, the reconciliation bill. Um, and, and here's how we, you know, I I'm gonna tie in on your story. Um, Joe Manchin comes out last week or end of last week, maybe beginning this week, um, and says, yeah, I'm looking at something that's more like $1 trillion. I yeah. could see myself going up to $1.5 trillion, but $3.5 trillion, we couldn't possibly do because, and then mumble, mumble, something inflation, <laughs> mumble, mumble. National security uh, and the national deficit. Security, yeah. I, you know, w w w I don't know what else comes after those words, but it, it's just sort of mumble, mumble, uh, institution, Senate, something, something. Um, so, like, first off, what's your sense? And there was already, I think uh, Stephanie Murphy came out and said she, from Florida in the House that she's not she's going to vote against it already because it, it's not she doesn't have enough time to read it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what's your sense of where it's what the where it, what, what's the state of play in the House and, uh, you know, the Senate? And then let's talk about the implications of, of your you know blockbuster story, because. You know, people say uh, Joe Biden, LBJ. Well, LBJ <laughs> me, would be would have would would. He'd know what to do with it. He'd know what to do with that story. It seems to be. But, so then the House is, I think, yes, yeah, Stephanie Murphy likely no. Uh, Kurt Schrader, former head of the Blue Dogs, I think is a pretty solid no. Um, Jared Golden, lean lean no, but like gettable. Um, but then everybody else, like every, pretty much everybody else is a likely, you know, is, is, is gettable. Like those are the two. Um, and, and they, they have, they, they have a margin three. of three, right? right. <laughs> Although they have Alcee Hastings seat is open and a Chantel Brown will win in November. And, uh, the Ohio governor, uh, did like did an incredible job screwing Democrats um, in, in keeping that seat open as long as humanly possible. Right. Uh, which is going to, which there were plenty of other people to run HUD like Biden didn't need to. And, and, and Pelosi finally was like, stop. Like after he picked plucked Deb Holland out of the house, he's like, she's like, stop. Like, right. what are you we doing? Don't you're making my job much harder because you're giving me a much thinner margin. And then if somebody dies like Alcee Hastings, right. um, you know, that election. So, the, you know, their cushion grows the longer they wait. Um, but the longer they wait, the harder it gets. Um, so they, they, you know, it's still alive, but yes. Yeah, so in the, on, in the Senate, it's Biden, uh, you know, it's, it's mansion and cinema, but with, with mansion really stealing a lot of that, a lot of that thunder, a lot of that spotlight. And yeah, so he said, uh, he doesn't want to do 3.5 trillion, uh, one to 1. 1.5. And, and he even said in the wall street journal, anybody who thinks this is political posturing should just consider the words of Admiral Mike Mullen, who said that national security is compromised by the deficit. It's like you set us up there. Like you're about to say something important. <laughs> <laughs> and then you finish the sentence with the deficit. Talking about, but Mike Mullen talking about the deficit. <laughs> What, like, what does he know about the deficit? Well, but now wait a second. See, here's the thing that I don't even understand that as a talking point, because is the reconciliation bill, at least in the context of like 10 years out. Now, we know there's all sorts of gimmicks and whatnot and, uh, you know, associated with this. But my understanding is like, doesn't that have to be deficit neutral under the reconciliation no. rules or no, it does not. It, it, it doesn't. It's whatever you write into the rules. OK. And so and the, the tax cut that that Trump did was allowed to be, I forget what exactly, but like 1.6 trillion under the deficit. Like, so it's what it's whatever you write into the, so it could actually include uh, $6.5 trillion in spending. And as long as it had 3 trillion in, in pay for us, 
is, is I think my understanding of how this, I haven't read these instructions, but that would be in line with how instructions like this would be passed. So it doesn't have to be deficit neutral. It's whatever you write into the instructions. And there's not going to be $3.5 trillion of new revenue, although. It could right, be. Well, well man, that's the thing. That, is that's the rub. Could, yeah. That's the thing is that, you know, the and and we should be clear here. I mean, you know, because I, I, uh, I know a lot of our viewers are, you know, modern monetary theorists. And the there's two ways in which you use taxes. Uh, one is to placate people who say you need to pay for something. <laughs> and then the other is to basically deal with wealth inequality mm -hmm. and to discourage behavior that you don't want to have to take place. And so today I um, uh, read a report that um, Sherrod Brown and Ron Wyden are going to introduce a provision to tax uh, stock buybacks, mm -hmm. which stock buybacks are very problematic. Um, part of a sort of um, a real, um, I think, a drag on the functioning of corporations that you combine with uh, the changes in capital gains taxes and the idea of stock buybacks uh, back in the early 80s under Reagan. And you start having board of directors and C-suite people basically having a cottage uh, industry, which is a side bet to what their company is actually doing. Like, you know, I can make all my money by just simply, um, you know, increasing our profits by cutting our workers. The health of the company, you know, five, 10 years from now is not really an issue to my pay because I, I'm tied to the stock price and the stock price isn't necessarily associated with the health of my company 10, 15, 20 years down the road and certainly not the community or anything else. Um, and so, um, you know, to, to tax the stock buybacks, you know, deals with wealth inequality and also sort of like changes a, um, you know, uh, realigns some incentives when it comes right. to corporate governance. Um, and so what, what 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 does a Joe Manchin do at that point where if people are like, well, you know, you're worried about the deficit, you know, OK, uh, let's tax more. Well, what he does is tries to push down the spending number so that there's less pressure on Congress to come up with those types of taxes. And so I think that's, a, that's basically what's going on here. He doesn't, that's his two step. He, right. he's worried. He doesn't want the taxes, but he can't and say that pretending it's right. about the spending. Right. Yes. That, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. And we have, uh, there was also a story about Heidi Heitkamp out, uh, right. who doing a similar thing on this, the, you know, and it's, it's a little bit complicated in terms of like the stepped up basis for inheritance tax. But if, you know, um, you know, if, if uh, mom or dad owns a house and uh, they give it to me and they bought it for $200,000 and now it's worth uh, $2 million, they give it to me at $2 million and anything above that is what I got to pay taxes on. Uh, essentially, if I sell it, as opposed to like, wait, this is accrued by uh, the, the the capital gains has gone up, and um, Heitkamp was said that was a racket to get rid of that, and then right, and there, there's all sort, but there's all sorts of exceptions for for property and for for those types of hand uh, hand hand downs or whatever you call it, um, but and the 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 more common scenario is somebody inherits a, a trust with filled with common stock worth $20 million that, you know, is made up of $15 million of, of which is, is capital gains. And so if the purse, if the, if the, if the dad had sold it, you know, would owe 5 million bucks right now, because he died and passed it down, that's wiped out. And, and now all of this G stock or this Apple stock, it's as if you just bought it today. Um, even though you're the, you know, the kid or the grandkid of the person who bought it and all of that, all of that's gone. So that, that like when people don't, pe people would much rather talk about a family farm, like Heidi Heidkamp wants to do, even though farms are just like, we've heard that talking point so many times that they've written into the law a million times. It's not going to take your farm. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's in, it's like right in, it's, that's practically the legislative language. Stop worrying about your farm. It's not about your farm. It's about your Apple stock, uh, you know, or what, whatever. And, and it's Apple stock. That's like over at least $2 million worth, right? You get $2 million the first, like, $2 worth that million was bought in like 1985. Yeah. Right. 
All right. Well, let's let's talk about the story that you guys did. You broke about um, about uh, Joe Manchin's daughter. Her name is Heather Bresh. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tell us about this story, because this, it seems to me, uh, should if I'm Joe, one would hope Joe Manchin would be like, hey, I'm not going to make too much of a stink right now. Maybe the opposite. But but tell us the story. Well, Mylan Pharmaceuticals is the, it's the, currently the distributor of EpiPen, and it's for years it was a kind of the pride of West, the pride of Morgantown. You know, this homegrown um, West Virginia pharmaceutical company that that that, uh, that trafficked in a lot of generics, like so, like really making the world a better place, like producing cheap, you know, affordable medications for people. Uh, so Heather Heather Bresch got a, got gets a job. Uh, working for them in the 2000s, 2007, she gets promoted to uh, chief operating officer, which is the first scandal that that hits the family because she had been claiming for a long time that she had this executive business degree and a master's from West Virginia University. And so like a good local paper, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, because it's Pittsburgh's like the biggest city near there, called West Virginia University you, you can call the registrar and ask about anybody's degree. I once called, asked if Yusuf Aloteba had actually graduated from Georgetown, like he claims to have. He's the ambassador from the UAE. They're like, nope, he didn't. <laughs> like, oh, good. Nice, <laughs> nice little nugget from my profile there. Um, and so they're like, no, no, she's like halfway there. Like she's not, not even close. It's not like uh, she didn't turn in her final paper. Not even close. So Pittsburgh paper reports that. Uh, then they get a call. From the school, there was a mistake. Uh, the governor's daughter, in fact, uh, did. Manchin was governor at the time. Manchin's governor in his second Co- term. Coincidence? Yes. Uh, he, he did. Oh no, the end of his first term. He. So they they run this correction. We're sorry. How could we have done this? She did. She does have a master's degree. Um, enough people knew that she did not because she wasn't even close. That they then had to. There were protests at the school. They had to they had to do an actual investigation where they hired an independent kind of legal team to like look into it. And they found that they had the school in response to the paper had like actively just fabricated grades and classes and everything to like give her this this degree. It led to the resignations of all the top leadership at, the, at West Virginia University, a huge college. Um, the only consequence for Bresh was that it she no longer listed that on her bio on, oh, on you gotta go back you gotta get yeah. copies of your cv i mean yeah. that's not <laughs> nothing yeah. right update, I mean, update you gotta update your linkedin <laughs> so she continued rising she becomes uh, ceo short, shortly thereafter president and ceo of Mylan pharmaceuticals uh, mansion's wife her mother uh becomes the top lobbyist for the association of school boards which will become relevant in a second. Um, so in, in, so she, Mylan owned the, the right to distribute EpiPen. It was made by, it was, the medicine was actually made by this other company, which uh, was, was getting purchased by, by Pfizer. Pfizer also made a competitor, kind of generic ish competitor called Adrenaclick. So now Mylan was facing the possibility that, that Pfizer is going to own not just part of EpiPen, but also own this generic ish competitor to it. And so I got an email that the subject of which is our discussion. And it's from Heather Bresch to Ian Reed, who is the CEO of Pfizer. She's saying, just wanted to confirm our discussion that after your purchase of King Pharmaceutical, uh, that you're going to divest from Adrenaclick. Just want to make sure we're all in the same, right? Because I saw you close today. She's now, wasting no mean? time. What does that mean? Divest from my like? What are the implications of that that what, that what company it, basically goes under? What it meant is they pulled Adrenaclick off the market. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's what they ultimately did later that year. In fact, so that that's so what. In other words, there's no competitor to EpiPen. Right. right. Now so, that you bought the now that you bought the supplier of the, like the medicine that goes inside the EpiPen you're going to get rid of the other distribution mechanism in the app in the click. And so that we're going to have no competitor and you're going to have no, you know, and, and we're, you're going to be our sole supplier. So we've right. created this sort of monopoly on both levels. Right. And then it's just off to the races because what right. happens to the price of EpiPen that went from a hundred dollars, right. To-, to well over $600. And then, Ooh. and then instantly like within, 
like as this is going on, in fact, uh, the, her executive team comes up with the idea. Why are, since people are going to die, you know, if they don't use the EpiPen at, immediately when they need it, why are we allowing them to just buy one? Like if we force them to buy two, they will buy two rather than die. And the internally they're writing about it in language like that. Like this is a matter of life or death for people. They will purchase two if we force them to. And so they, they, they concoct this, what they call project X two, which is to eliminate the, uh, the single EpiPen pack. And they're not selling you a, two of them, you know, for the price of one or two at a discount, it's, they're just doubling the price and forcing you to buy two. I, I got an email from uh, a sales associate to the medical team saying, Hey, I need a quote medical rationale for this. Cause I'm oh. supposed to present this to Heather. And then later I got an email from the CEO saying like, yeah, the medical folks say that we can't really use medical guidelines to, to drive this because it's, it's not, it's not true. Right. There's actually no reason why, right. from a medical standpoint, why you need two EpiPens right. as if opposed you're, to if, one if EpiPen. You're, you, if you're a patient, you'd probably rather have two in case one misfires or something. I could understand why somebody would want to have two, but you don't, you don't need to have two. And if you're doubling the price and you're keeping it from somebody, that's probably, that's probably worse. So they push this through. They talk to Pfizer and they're like, they're, I have emails say Pfizer's all in. They, you know, they like this idea. Somebody says, what about the FDA? And, and somebody else says, uh, don't call or write the FDA because it would raise more questions than we have answers. And so what's, in other words, this yeah. is a classic better to apologize than to ask yes. permission type of scenario. And somebody's like, what about all the payers, the insurers? And they're like, well, we're, we're under a billion in revenue. I think we'll quote fly under the radar. Like, so the, they're, they're, they're conspiring to conceal the scheme from the regulators and from the people that are going to be uh, paying for it. And what's so amazing to me is, is that it, sh it shows how endemic this, this stuff is in the industry that they would just be hashing this out over email. Right. That this is, they, they don't feel like as, as sort of like grotesque as this is and arguably illicit, right? Mm -hmm. or, or, no, yeah, yeah, no, you, you could easily have, uh, in fact, they're getting sued for it right now. And, and plenty of those plaintiffs attorneys would say, uh, this, this, this borders into criminal territory. And so the idea that they don't even feel like we need to hide our tracks, it's more like this is not like, you know, you right. would imagine like the, the CEO of the co company would not be, be, you know, laying it out there. Now, uh, it, it, there's no record in the exhibits of Ian Reed replying to that email. So it, he might have been like, oh, gee, I, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Like we, we talked put it in email. We talked about this on the phone. Never <laughs> for email. a reason. <laughs> what are you doing? Um so So yeah, the uh, price went up over six hundred dollars. Um she she then did face some scrutiny in twenty sixteen when it hit that number. Oh, and Gail Manchin then lobbied all of these school districts to require these schools to purchase epipens. So that helped drive up the price too. Uh, so she, she did appear in front of Congress, but at the time there wasn't this evidence of her, you know, of her directly talking about this discussion, uh, with Ian Reed, this, this only came out through, a uh, unsealed as part of this court case last week. Um, so it, it really ties every ties it all together and, and links it with the project X two because right. Like, and, and the, the other salesperson, is also like, saying that this is medically necessary also is a bit inconsistent because we're only doing it in the US. <laughs> well, you know, the Europeans, they uh, they have a different uh, they have they their need bodies, different, different allergies. Food, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the EpiPen. And and we should say so um uh uh Bresch, uh leaves right in after the investigations into this and uh, sadly only got like a, what, like a $30, 30 million dollar payout? 36 million or something. So, and actually the I company mean, was sold to Pfizer. Um, ah. So Pfizer just gobbled the whole thing up. And then uh, it's now uh, Viatris, I think is, is the company that owns this part of Mylan. And so they, at the same month that, that Bresch left with her 30 plus million dollar package, closed down the Morgantown plant. The, with 1500 jobs lost. So it's not even that all of this corruption 
and self-dealing at least creates 1500 jobs for people in, in Morgantown, like the plant is getting closed. Um, and it's like, come on, mansion. Like you can't like you, you can ask for anything you want in this reconciliation package. If you ask for $50 million a year for the next hundred years, like to keep this plant going, producing generics, doing research for West Virginia university, what the Schumer would give that to you before you could finish asking for it. Right. Okay. So with all this said, I mean, call it, call all, it the Heather Bresch. Well, research. that's actually, yes, we were talking about that, right? Like the, um, what was it? The corn husker kickback. Right. And, uh, what, uh, what would else do they call it? The, uh, Florida flim flam, the Louisiana purchase, the Louisiana purchase, the Florida flim flam and the, uh, corn husker kickback were the things that the right wing were talking about, yep. uh, when it came to the ACA, I think, um, I think that's what John McCain was actually calling them at the time. You know, it's a way of trying to maybe distance himself from his savings and loans issue uh, yes. back in the day is Keating seven or whatever it was. And so, all right, well, uh, all right. So let me ask you this. I mean, and, and I should say the, the the story that you've written is both. Um, I mean, it's it is uh, it's an amazing insight into the what's going on with the pharmaceuticals as to like why we pay so much for these pharmaceuticals i mean you know these are not like bit players pfizer right. is not <laughs> pfizer. a big player they're a big deal they're a big deal um and you know they're just a little more sophisticated like you don't use the email folks like and uh, you know we you don't send emails you don't do it that way I, I don't that probably went in my spam folder is what they probably are trained mm -hmm. to say at that point and I never saw it. Don't remember um, that discussion. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember that phone call at all. Um, and it also talks about the obvious corruption that is uh, associated with uh, Joe Manchin. Uh, I don't think it was a coincidence that West Virginia University calls back and says, actually, no, we, right. we, we wrote out all these grades. So, like, how does this get leveraged at this point? I mean, you know, I um, it 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 would it's gross that these things are not, you know, there's no accountability for it, but there's not going to be. So the question becomes like, how does, how do we take this uh, lemon, which is Joe Manson's, uh, you know, uh, family is incredibly corrupt um, and turn it into some lemonade where that ultimately leads to an expansion of Medicare, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, better Medicare services, uh, home health care and paid sick leave, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Manchin's objective here is to come out of this in a better political position than he went into it. So to the extent that that's not happening, then th that disincentivizes whatever behavior he's engaging in is, is the way is the way I would put it. And I think Daniel Bogus Law at The Intercept also did a really good piece the week before um, investigating his coal empire, because people don't realize after he was elected to the state, uh, the House of Delegates in, in West Virginia, he then opened a coal company. He, he launched his own coal brokerage firm and, you know, which is a common pastime of West Virginia politicians. You do the politics first and that leads to the wealth. And so that's that those companies are now owned or operated or they're not operated by Joe Manchin, the fourth Joe Manchin, who is Joe Manchin's son, but he, but Manchin himself is still a, a major owner. He report, he's reported more than $4 million in, in income you know, from, from these coal businesses, since he's been elected to the Senate, he's making every year, something like half a million dollars from these businesses. Uh, he has, he, he says he put them in a blind trust, but if you, if it's a company that you own, <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. As you know, I'm you no, still I'm own no it. longer doing business decisions, but you know, it's a coal company. Right. So you're going to do stuff so that the coal business, just broadly speaking, is benefited because you have a coal business. I mean, it's really just sort of like, I don't know, I, I have an ice cream uh, uh, business, but I have no say on how they operate. I'm just making the laws as to what constitutes good nutrition. And I just happen to think it's ice cream and i think sherbert should be banned exactly 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 i just, I just do it's just it's terrible it's gross it's gross it's me throw you out not, of here it's no. not really a dessert thing so i mean you know so right so if if it look if if his motivations appear to be driven by support for the pharmaceutical industry which his family's making tens of million dollars and and, and engaged in possibly illegal schemes and his family's making millions of dollars from the coal industry. 
that 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 drains some of the energy out of his uh you know out of his like attempts to portray himself as this person who's just just looking out for the deficit here to whom to whom does that like i mean like who's the audience that he's he's playing right. well it, it well it has to be i mean it has to become a dominant public narrative like you'd have to have msnbc rachel maddow and chris hayes uh lawrence o'donnell like it's not impossible um uh, but but they'd have to decide to, to cover they po- cover, and, they'd have and- to decide to cover politics in a in a way that that includes that is more holistic than than the media tends to cover politics it's, well you know we the, the media covers politics as as a horse race and as a competition between competing ideas right as conservatives opposed- and liberals and moderates and de- deficit hawks and as opposed to no this this is a coal baron right a pharmaceutical executives right. uh dad you know who has particular interests at play here all right well uh there it is uh anybody's uh listening uh back at msnbc this will be on the choice but not necessarily have the same range as it would uh <laughs> if if the uh, varsity team uh took it up um ryan grimm um thank you so much we'll put a link to these stories people should pass these stories around send them to your favorite uh news host uh and have them repeat them uh ryan thanks so much for your time really appreciate it Real pleasure folks there's more of what you've just saw where that came from that's if you hit the subscribe and like button thank you really thank you